and there shall be signs in the sun, and in the moon, and in the stars, and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear, and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken. One man, one microphone, one mission, one message. True News, the only newscast reporting the countdown to the second coming of Jesus Christ. And now for the most powerful hour on radio, here is End Time Newsman, Rick Wiles. This is True News, the news program that reports the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help us God. I'm Rick Wiles. Welcome to one hour of uncensored news, views, and commentary. Former Reader's Digest editor Lowell Ponte will join me in several minutes. We'll talk about China's aim to topple the U.S. dollar, Saudi Arabia's threat to ditch the petrodollar, and I'll ask him a question or two about weather modification, weather warfare, and chemtrails and stuff like that. Let's take a quick look at the news headlines. New York City voters elected a flaming communist as their next mayor. Bill Blasio, a guy who went to Nicaragua in the 1980s to help the communist Sandinistas, won a whopping 73% of the vote against pro-abortion, pro-gay rights Republican Joe Loda. Mr. Blasio told cheering supporters last night that the first thing he'll do as mayor is impose a new tax on wealthy residents. In Virginia, Clinton fundraiser Terry McAuliffe won the governorship. Pro-abortion Ralph Northam easily defeated Reverend E.W. Jackson for lieutenant governor. Bishop Jackson has been a guest on True News several times. He said Planned Parenthood has killed more black babies than the KKK. The Republican Party establishment disowned him. In New Jersey, pro-abortion, pro-gay rights Republican Chris Christie cruised to an easy re-election as New Jersey governor. His political godfather, Henry Kissinger, is very happy today. In Switzerland, a team of scientists examined the remains of old Yasser Arafat. His body was exhumed for an autopsy. The scientists, once they got inside and took a look, discovered that Arafat's skeleton is radioactive. So that means Arafat was either poisoned, murdered, or I guess the other option is Yasser didn't know how to handle nuclear materials. In Japan, Tokyo Electric Power Company was scheduled to start Friday on the process of removing thousands of spent fuel rods precariously sitting atop damaged reactor number four. Now, fuel rods must not touch each other. Neither can they be exposed to air. So this should be interesting. The process has been delayed for several weeks. But uh, Bill and Joe in Idaho, what could possibly go wrong, right? Reactor number four contains 10 times the amount of cesium-137 that was at Chernobyl. Yale professor Charles Perro said if the rods are not kept separate and cooled, fission would take place. And an explosion would require the evacuation of Tokyo. University of Alberta scientist David Suzuki said if Reactor 4's rods are exposed to air or if the reactor collapses due to an earthquake, it would be the end of Japan and America's West Coast would have to be evacuated. Iran's foreign minister, Mohammad Javad Zarif, told France 24 TV that A deal with the West is possible this week. The next round of negotiations start in Geneva on Thursday. The London Times reported on Monday that Western nations will offer Iran a substantial cash incentive to show the West that it is willing to make a good faith effort to negotiate a more complete agreement regarding its nuclear program. You understand what that means? The United States and the West are going to pay off Iran if they just promise to negotiate and act in good faith to convince the West that they're going to end their nuclear program. Well, I think you already know how that's going to work out. Uh, Secretary of State John Kerry is struggling to salvage the Obama administration's foreign policy in the Middle East. He's dealing with crisis in uh, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, and Israel. 
He arrived in Israel last night, met with Prime Minister Netanyahu and Palestinian President Abbas to prevent the Palestinian-Israeli peace talks from collapsing. The peace talks broke down Monday when Israeli and Palestinian negotiators got into a shouting match over 3,500 Israeli houses being built in the West Bank in East Jerusalem. Mr. Kerry branded the settlements as illegitimate. And in an effort to appease the Palestinians, Mr. Kerry quickly pledged an additional $75 million in U.S. foreign aid to the Palestinians. Let's take a break. Lo Ponte will be here when I return. Reporting the countdown to the second coming of Jesus Christ. You're listening to True News, the end time newscast. This is Max McLean. Despite distress and unbelief, how did Jesus heal the synagogue ruler's daughter? Listen to the Bible from Mark 5. He went in and said to them, While this commotion and wailing, the child is not dead but asleep. But they laughed at him. After he put them all out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples all with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which means little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately the girl stood up and walked round. She was twelve years old. At this they were completely astonished. He gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this and told them to give her something to eat. From Mark 5, listen to the Bible. It's great for the soul. The Bible says that faith comes by hearing. Hear more at radiobible.org. This is True News, your alternative source for global news, analysis, and commentary. I'm Rick Walls. France 24 TV reported today that China is seeking a greater role in the world financial system for its UN currency to challenge the supremacy of the U.S. dollar. If you recall, two weeks ago, the Xinhua News Agency published an editorial calling for a new world order without the United States front and center in that new world order. The editorial said, what we need is a de-Americanized world. It called for the creation of a new international reserve currency. Of course, the Chinese are uh, the first to say that the U.N. should be the new uh, global reserve currency. So is the dollar headed for the dustbin, or are America's enemies too eager to see it go down? How long can the Federal Reserve print funny money before it triggers a loss of confidence in the dollar? Mr. Lowell Ponte is on the telephone to discuss these issues and a lot more. He was uh, an editor for the Reader's Digest magazine for many years. He is the co-author of several books, including The Great Withdrawal, The Great Debasement, and the Inflation Deception. Mr. Ponte currently writes for Newsmax.com, and uh, this is his first time on the program. Lowell, welcome to True News. Rick, it is a great honor to be with you. Yes, sir. Well, you know, I think I can tell by, uh, you know, the, the titles of your book. I think I think I know the answer uh, to some of my questions. Uh, but let's let's start out with this, uh, this story that's um, out today by France 24 TV that China China, uh, you know, wants uh, the uh, UN currency to become the global reserve currency. Are they, um, they have a chance at this, or, or as they say here in the South, are they whistling Dixie? Well, they, by the way, Dixie itself, as a word, has a financial origin. <laughs> really? As you may know. Yes. Yeah, we, we can get right. into that a little later if you want. Okay. But, but to answer your question directly, uh, China has been trying to undermine the dollar for a long time. They have entered into bilateral agreements with Russia, with Japan, and others to carry out trade uh, in their own currencies, the significance of which is when you say the U.S. dollar is the world reserve currency ever since Bretton Wood, the major agreement that we put together after World War II, what that means is if uh, Poland wants to buy a barrel of oil from Saudi Arabia, it first has to convert its currency into dollars. And the actual trade is then carried out in dollars. Now, that is a tremendous advantage. What uh, the French Chancellor of the Exchequer once called America's exorbitant privilege, because we're the guys who print the world's reserve currency. It gives us almost limitless entree, limitless credit, and so on around the world. And China would certainly love to undermine that, because they would like to take that place for themselves. 
They are the world's most populous country, at least for the moment. They'll soon be overtaken by India. And they aspire to have the renminbi, or the yuan, whichever you wish to call it, their currency, have a much more prominent place. The difficulty they've had, of course, is in recent years, they have at once wanted to be able to manipulate the value of their currency randomly, Uh, for their own benefit at any given moment, but they want to be taken seriously as a stable, reliable currency that that others would be willing to rely on. Now, you can't easily be both unless, of course, you are a graduate of the Ben Bernanke School of of International Economics. That's right. Because the U.S. has certainly done that with our money. Well, you mentioned, uh, as an example, Poland buying oil, and it's... uh the trade is denominated in dollars. Well, several weeks ago, the uh, the London newspapers reported the very shocking story that the Saudi Arabians are furious with Barack Obama and the United States over Mr. Obama's uh, stand down regarding Syria. And uh, several high ranking Saudi princes, uh, including uh, Prince ben- Bandar Ben Sultan, uh, the the director of the Saudi intelligence agency sent forth word that that Saudi Arabia is rethinking its relationship with America and would soon announce a major shift in its relationship with the United States of America. He said it's going to have profound consequences for America and the world, and he specifically said in relation to oil and weapons. Well, anybody who knows. Anything about history knows what he's referring to. It's it's the it's the petrodollar agreement that Saudi Arabia worked out with Richard Nixon and Henry Kissinger in 1973 when Nixon took the U.S. dollar off the gold standard in 71. Mr. Kissinger and Mr. Nixon came up with a really crafty um, <laughs> scheme that that bought the United States dollar. You know, another forty some years on the world stage. But that deal said with Saudi Arabia, um, we the United States will give Saudi Arabia carte blanche military protection. In return, all Arab oil sales are done in dollars, and Saudi Arabia's excess oil profits are plowed back into the United States by buying bonds, which will then finance the U.S. Uh, national debt. So if the Saudis are at the point pulling the plug on that deal. And, and what, the, what the London paper said was uh, that uh, they were furious that, that Barack Obama would not pledge to King Abdullah that if a war broke out in the Middle East over Syria, that the U.S. would defend Syria. So that means in the eyes of the Saudis, they see Barack Obama as a covenant breaker. And therefore... The 1973 petrodollar covenant is now null and void. Well, as always, things in the Middle East are incredibly complex and interwoven. Here are a few of the problems. Half a thousand years ago, Europe was torn by religious wars between what became Protestants and the ruling Roman Catholic Church. That same thing is going on today in the Muslim world in the great war between Sunnis and Shiites. Saudi Arabia, of course, is a Sunni country. It is the home of Mecca. It is the great spokes country for the faith, meaning 85% of the faith. But the problem is we're now seeing uh, Syria as a country being torn to see who will, uh, which of those two religious factions will control Syria. And, of course, Iran is a Shiite country. Iran and its allies are part of the major attempt to overthrow and manipulate the government there, even though uh, Syria is nominally allied with Iran. So it's an interesting question how that would shake out, and I know that's a great concern to the Saudis. Also of concern to the Saudis, the U.S. has been letting its oil production skyrocket, not because Barack Obama wants it. In fact, he would probably deter it if he could. But it's mainly happening on private land in places like the Bakken Field in North Dakota. And as a result, uh, our ability to export oil is beginning to threaten Saudi exports in the world. I mean, we're becoming, again, arguably the world's dominant oil producer, if we wish to be. 
And so that, too, complicates the Saudi position. Third, you will notice we had one major expert uh, behind the Institute for Science and International Security, a physicist who was a weapon inspector and official at the International Atomic Energy Agency just a few days ago, say that Iran is now within uh, a month, maybe two months at most. In other words, before our new year of having the stuff to make nuclear weapons. Now, this means the Saudis doubtless feel they need just to balance power in the region to decide whether that body of water between the two countries will be called the Persian Gulf after Iran or the Arabian Gulf, as they call it. Ironically, we call it the Persian Gulf. And, and, and just today, but, the, the Iranian foreign minister, Zavid, uh, Sarid, I think his name, is uh, said that there's a good chance the West and Iran are going to cut a deal this week in Geneva. And uh, and then on I think it was Monday, the London Times said that the U.S. or the West is going to offer Iran a a very lucrative cash incentive to to agree to some deal uh, sure, well, with the West. We were, when we were in a Cold War opposition to the Soviet Union, there there was at least one advantage to it, and that is the Soviets, as atheists, didn't believe they had any heaven to go to if they died in a nuclear war. And therefore, they really did not want a nuclear war. But when you are dealing with the theocratic 14th century Islamist regime in Tehran, uh, a good deal of their people may be perfectly willing to die in setting off a nuclear device so that they can go to heaven, get the 72 virgins they're promised as Muslims, right. and so on. So, so therefore, we have the most terrifying of all kinds of enemies there, potentially an enemy who's not afraid of dying. So what does this mean if Barack Obama, you know, struts around the world stage and and says, look, I, I solved the Iranian crisis. Uh, we have a deal. U.S. and Iran are now friends. Uh, what is this going to do to Saudi Arabia and Israel? Are they are they going to say, OK, we have no other choice but to go this alone? And are we going to see Saudi Arabia and Israel team up to attack Iran? Well, understand, Iran will not depend on missiles necessarily as a delivery system for their nuclear weapons, weapons that President Obama seems not to be lifting much of a finger to stop. They're going to use terrorists. And so here we sit with an open border with Mexico. Uh, do we really believe that Iran would be incapable of providing nuclear weapons to terrorists who could simply bring them into the United States, put them on a Volkswagen van, and drive them to downtown Dallas or Fort Worth or Houston? Uh, no. I mean, they're, they're quite capable of doing that. And if one such bomb went off, then people in New York who hadn't even been hit yet, or people in Los Angeles, will be devastated by it because that will collapse the U.S. economy. Mm -hmm. I mean, investment will stop. People going to the mall to shop will stop. All kinds of terrible things will ensue, and the government, to prop that up, will then begin printing tens of trillions of dollars a week to try to fund the economy and the world system. And so the dollar will become valueless and collapse as well. All of this just from a single act or two of nuclear terrorism that Iran could precipitate. Now, given that, Saudi Arabia looks at that and says, I guess we better build up a nuclear arsenal ourselves to deter them. Well, the Saudi regime is actually very fragile. The Saudi regime could collapse overnight. Who then gets those weapons if they've been built up? Israel may feel forced to try to preempt uh, Iran taking this, this final step. It doesn't have quite enough muscle to do it effectively, but they may feel they have to try. And so we have all this potential chaos stemming from that. Remember, too, they have the same kind of apocalyptic vision as we see in the book of Revelation in Christian culture. They're waiting for the, what is it, seventh imam. Mm -hmm. uh, um, they are waiting for the, Mahdi, the right. spoke, yeah, the Mahdi, yeah. who is supposed to bring the ultimate triumph of Islam by fire and sword, spoken of in the Hadith, the verbal tradition of Islam. And as a result, uh, they may believe, gee, we may want to just start setting off some weapons, uh, and what better place than just a few miles from Armageddon, otherwise known as Armageddon in northern Israel. 
So we may be seeing all kinds of history unfolding here beyond the simple economics of the U.S. Mm -hmm. But in the meanwhile, having an indecisive president who seems unwilling or unable to do much of anything other than get a piece of paper. I mean, you, you remember Chamberlain coming back from meeting with Herr Hitler and saying, we do have peace, I have a piece of paper Adolf Hitler signed. I don't know that President Obama getting a piece of paper signed by the mullahs in Iran is going to make much difference for the Ayatollahs. I, I think that will just be a delusion. And, and the rest of the world will see that as Iranian nuclear weapons by terrorists are now on the way. Going back to what I was asking earlier about Saudi Arabia and these threats that they've made about severing the relationship with the U.S., they also said that they're shopping for a new security partner. Now, there's only two potential partners. That's Russia and China. Uh, do you see any possibility that Saudi Arabia c could negotiate some type of, of long-range agreement with either China or Russia or maybe both together that gives China and Russia a major foothold in Saudi Arabia and changes the, the dynamic of the world economic system? Well, Russia is itself a major oil producer. China is not. China has actually had all kinds of deals with the Iranians to supply up 15% or so of their oil. And therefore, we have the question, would China also cut such deals with Saudi Arabia? Would that alienate their relationship with Iran? They probably see Iran as a much stronger nation at this point. And... <coughs> So it's an interesting question. Mm -hmm. well, I don't, I don't I, think. I, mean, but, I don't think. But, if, Prince... but if you have limitless mm -hmm. oil, mm -hmm. Saudi. By the way, the soy, the Saudi oil fields are in decline right now. Mm -hmm. And China needs the oil. They're, they're, they're not producing oil, so th they would be the biggest customer for the oil. Uh, and I don't think uh, Prince Bandar bin Sultan did himself any good when months ago, uh, according to the uh, the reports, when he met with uh, Vladimir Putin. He hinted that Saudi Arabia controls the al-Qaeda terrorists who could blow up the 2014 Winter Olympic Games in Russia. I don't think that went down too well. I would think it wouldn't. But, of course, Russia is in an interesting position. I mean, on one side, they have China that has long eyed the mineral fields and so on just across the border in, in Siberia. This is why China has long had a polar pardon me, Russia has long had a policy of cutting special deals with the Japanese, virtually giving them mining concessions all along the Chinese border so that one price China would pay for attacking Russia would be to kill a lot of Japanese. And that would bring Japan into any conflict against them instead of neutral. Uh, that's been policy for, what, 30 years or more by Russia. Uh, so they have an enemy on one side. They have Muslims all along the southern tier of their frontier who are also capable of spawning Islamists. And they have Germany on the other side of them. So if you're Russia, what amazes me is why they don't try to be friendlier to the U.S. Because in the long run, Russia is in demographic decline. Their population is actually dying off slowly. This is why they have these special days every year to get incentivize people to breed in Russia now. Uh, and they're, they're a country potentially surrounded by enemies right now. So I don't know why they think they would have ultimately salvation from alliances with either the Saudis, who regard them as atheist devils, uh, or the Iranians, both of whom are quite capable of arming their enemies if they think Russia is about to fall. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the Russian, um, uh, the, the, the general in charge of the Russian GRU military intelligence was in Cairo last week, and he met with General Sisi. And uh, he's, uh, he's asking for a port for the Russian Navy in Egypt. And so, again, we're seeing where Obama's um, weak leadership whether it's deliberate or or not, is is giving Russia a, an open door to expand its influence in the Middle East. In fact, right now, what the Russian Navy is in control of the Mediterranean. The U.S. and the Western nations withdrew from the Mediterranean after 
the U.S. stood down in Syria. Yes, after after the uh, debacle in in Cyprus, where Angela Merkel was tired of having a tax haven, nominally mm-hmm. within the EU, um, and and even within the eurozone, uh, there was a lot of talk about Russia actually getting naval concessions on Cyprus. They certainly mm-hmm. would like drilling concessions for the oil off the coast. Well, that was Ru- oh, Russian money. That was Russian money in the Cyprus banks that the EU was planning to steal. Uh, well, the EU did steal a good deal of it, but oddly, they didn't enough, take the Russian money. They allowed the Russians to get the money out, and then they exact, stu- they stole exactly they, the, they stole the money of the Cypriot people. And in, in fact, we make that point in our new book, The Great Withdrawal, that the Russian money mysteriously did vanish into still open branches of the Cypriot banks in in Great Britain and in Moscow. It was all it was almost all pulled out. There were a few small Russian businessmen. Who were hit by this? But none of the big guys. Well, don't you th- don't you think the Kremlin informed the EU you steal our money and you guys are going to be floating in the rivers? Oh, I'm sure they did. I, I mean, this is the magic thing about tax havens. They were the Angela Merkel and others were terribly critical of Cyprus, but they were not critical of London, which is also a major tax haven. They were not terribly critical of Malta and other places that are major tax havens. Those were allowed to, to stay. But eventually they do want to shut down all places that the rich can escape. Because? Because they want the money. They want the, And the, the governments of are course. broke, and they have to grab the money. Well, this is the problem you have when, for example, as in America today, you only have 101 million Americans working full-time, but you have 108 million Americans on welfare programs of one kind or another, when you have 49.2% of households in the U.S. who are getting some kind of government check by someone in that household. Uh, yes, I mean, we're now at a tipping point, as Stephen Moore of the Wall Street Journal likes to say, between the makers and the takers. And so far, the takers are winning. And if they win much more, all future elections will just be bidding wars. Who will give you the bigger government check? Well, so far this year, two major American cities have elected communists as mayors. New York City elected a communist yesterday, Blasio. And uh, several months ago, the capital of, of Mississippi, Jackson, Mississippi, elected a radical Marxist communist as its mayor. Uh, what is his name? Lumumba? The guy, well, the guy wants but, to start but, but, the but new the point, Africa. The point is, cities have now become, for example, we have a whole chapter devoted to Detroit in our new book, The Great Withdrawal. The essence of which is that the successful people, both black and white, fled Detroit. Their population fell from about 1.8 million to 700,000 today. And who was left? Well, basically the people with their hands out, the guinea pigs and the people employed by government itself. And most of the productive people have left. So then who does pay the bill? This is why, for example, you have Al Gore uh, and others who have long opposed urban sprawl, as they call it. What they mean by sprawl is people moving far enough out that they're no longer taxable by inner-city political bosses who who need to feed all those people. The irony, though is that urban sprawl would actually be a wonderful form of national defense in America. I mean, in in an age of nuclear terrorism and Mm -hmm. so on, it's the big centralized targets that are the the real places in danger. Our pioneer forefathers would have had very little problem with that. They were spread far beyond big cities. They had their own wells and cut their own wood for food and, and or, or for, for fuel. They grew their own food or shot game and so on. They could defend themselves. They were armed. Uh, they did not need a city to protect them. Speaking of, of cities being targets, what do you think of China's open threat last week in the Chinese news media, naming the cities they, they will nuke and the, the ex- estimated death toll? Well, you know, this is kind of like, oh, we're shocked, shocked that we were listening in on Angela Merkel's cell phone. Uh, It's just assumed that all major countries have contingency plans to destroy anyone and everyone. I guarantee you we have contingency plans to drop nukes on every city in Europe. But but, but we don't have no intent to do it. I mean, we have the plans. But the difference is it's not on CNN and Fox. You don't have you don't. They're not showing the maps of China, saying you know 
this, you know, these many millions of people are going to die in Shanghai and this many millions are going to die in Beijing. I mean, this is what the Chinese media were talking about last week. Why, yeah, why, they, why, they, why do they, they have these discussions and open? Oh, sure, but they love to be theatrical that way. Mm-hmm. Is it all I mean, propaganda? If, if, you, if you have doubts that you can actually do something, then the next best thing is to claim you can do it. So is it, and, is it merely propaganda? Uh, I don't think their missiles are accurate enough to be able to hit a city with guaranteed... Uh, oh, I think, I think Bill Clinton made sure he sold the right technology to them. Uh, actually, up until then, they hadn't even been able to effectively launch a missile. Much That's less right, until, it on until Bill Clinton sold the, the American technology to them. And, mm-hmm. th- and now we're going we're gonna to pay the price for, for Bill Clinton's treason. Oh, sure. Well, well, this is the difficulty we have. When Democrats do agree to cut government, it's always national defense. I mean, Bill Clinton was gutting national defense to the tune of $125 billion a year in order to help create the prosperity that he boasted of. He basically took the entire peace dividend of the Cold War and cashed it in all at once, and then claimed that he had brought about prosperity in America. All he'd done is burn up our credit card with the overage on it. And as a result, we wound up seeing the World Trade Center destroyed and so on, because he had helped blind our security apparatus. He had made us more vulnerable to terrorism in addition to warfare. But I personally am still... And Do you you remember when his uh, national security advisor, Sandy uh, Berger... Mm-hmm. got caught sticking uh, 9-11 evidence in his underwear and trying to get it out of the government office? Uh, in fact, for a time, he did get it out of the government That's office. That's right. <clears throat> oh, oh, no, I mean, when, when the historic revisionism is done of all these things, of course, it'll be written by the winner. But if the good guys ultimately win... The picture of what's been done to American security will just be appalling. Even now, the Obama administration is carrying out a rolling purge of the officer corps in the U.S. Mm -hmm. So, but who are the good guys? I don't know. They're in effect politicizing the military by doing that. They're just leaving their kind of Mm -hmm. people in power. Uh, Who are the good guys? I don't know if there are any good guys left. The thing has become so corrupt, so convoluted, so complicated that you know. I think many. Average American citizens are just standing back saying, what in the world has happened to this country? Well, but the good news is we're seeing President Obama panic. This is what we talk about in the Great Withdrawal. When he has to go to the level of politicizing the IRS to stifle his opponents, when when we adopt massive surveillance of the American people, when we create a virtual police state out of regulation, I mean, we just had one American company told they would have to pay thirteen billion dollars. Well, how does that turn into something? How does that be turned around to something good? Because the way I see this going, we're we're going deep into a socialist police state. When you see that, when you see cities go over to that, all that tells you is that the city is getting ready to collapse. Okay, it doesn't mean the city is going to get any stronger. the good news is that panic reflects the fact that they're scared to death of losing power. And they're, the only response progressives have to that, in fact, a lot of our book explains how crazy progressives really are. When they do that, that means they know they have lost uh, the support of the people. In fact, we now have recent polls. Sixty percent of the American people say the Obama administration is ruling without the consent of the governed. Now that, you read our Declaration of Independence, that's the only thing that gives the government legitimacy. Okay, but they just they just elected a communist as mayor of New York City. But it doesn't matter. And Bill Clinton's fundraiser won the Commonwealth of Virginia. So how if, if the people are, are turning against them, then how are they winning? Well, I prefer to say the Republican Party lost the governorship of the state of Virginia because they withdrew their support from their own candidate. Right. And, and left him to die, and he lost by only, what, 1% or so. so. So why did the National Republican Party put a knife in its back? Because somehow they don't like... See, govern, the people who rule are basically the same people. I remember when I was a callow youth in Washington, D.C., as a journalist, I used to hang out with the now late Arthur Crock, who for 30 years was head of the New York Times Bureau in Washington, D.C. What that meant is he knew where all the skeletons were buried. When you're the bureau chief of the national newspaper of record, you have that kind of power and information. 
And he turned to me one day, I'm a 24-year-old kid, this is long, long ago, and he says to me, you know, Lowell, with the exception of my friend Barry Goldwater, I've never known a politician in this town, Republican or Democrat, liberal or conservative, who wouldn't sell his own mother in an instant in order to gain 5% more power or glory for himself. Now, this wasn't coming from a drunk at the end of the local bar. This was coming from a guy who knew all the secrets, all the dirt, all the filth on all these people of both parties, and he had absolute contempt for all of them, except Barry Goldwater. Uh, And uh, I've always, as a libertarian, come to understand and appreciate just what that meant. You know, you're not going to find salvation in the Republican Party today. Uh, you well, might be able to bully. At least they have to use pro-American rhetoric in the Republican Party. They don't even do that anymore in the Democratic Party. Mm-hmm. Are, are you uh, are you officially a libertarian? Oh, I am officially a libertarian, but I, that doesn't mean I would support someone who was funded with Clinton fundraiser money, as the libertarian was, taking 7% in the Virginia mm-hmm. race. I mean, that's a case where uh, Rand Paul... And other libertarians went into the state and said, for God's sake, don't elect Terry McAuliffe by, by throwing your vote to the libertarian here. This is not a race to do that. But they did, and that was more than the margin of victory. Ironically, though, this means that, what, 54% of the people of Virginia voted against Obamacare, because that's what the race polarized on, uh, and voted against Terry McAuliffe. So he's very far from winning a majority here. I think he wound up with, what, 48, 47 percent. Right. Uh, Lowell, do you know anything about the transatlantic trade pact that is uh, in its final stages before ratification? No, actually, that's one thing. Even though I have a master's degree in international Mm -hmm. relations, I haven't paid a whole lot of attention to that. Well, you might want to look into this, because around 2007, George Bush said that the the American and European economies would be merged by the year 2015. And the treaty is, uh, they're in the final stages of, uh, uh, of uh, drafting this thing. Uh, w- one of the reasons uh, the Europeans are so upset about the NSA spying is that they, they realize that their, their negotiating position in, in this treaty has been compromised. Um, and some of the European papers are saying, you know, the treaty's got to go ahead regardless of the NSA spying. It's, it's that vital. But uh, well, well, there's since, a major... Since our Federal Reserve largely controls their economies or keeps their economies afloat, Europe nominally uh, supplies 25% of the world's GDP, but their economies in general are in very bad shape. They have the usual chronic double-digit unemployment the only thing you can say for them is, in some ways, they're continuing to move to the right politically while we are moving to the left. So we're becoming more like Europe. In fact, a couple of weeks ago, I praised Barack Obama for having finally overcome our long-term envy of France for having a 35-hour work week. Because now, under Barack Obama, we've gotten to a 29 and a half hour. That's work right. Week. That's right. His socialist agenda has, has succeeded. Uh, most of the Americans are going to be working part time hours. And for hours. millions of Americans, that's, of course, on the way to a zero hour work week. But this is the challenge. We create a welfare state, we fund it out of funny money printed from thin air. By the way, before I forget, we have this amazing little book called The Great Withdrawal. And I would be happy to give a 1,000 of your listeners one of these absolutely free and postpaid, if you'd like. Sure, go ahead. Yeah, this is a 250-page book. Uh, it costs $20 at the bookstore, but my co-author, Craig Smith, basically is just scared the country's going to hell in a handbasket for his children and grandchildren. And so we're just trying to arm people with the information herein and give them a kind of survival guide, show them why American values can yet prevail because the only thing progressives know how to do is centralize power even more, whereas we have decentralized power. The Internet, 3D printers that let you print a gun in your own home, and so on, that can circumvent and bring down this hopeless progressive attempt. I mean, the more they centralize, the worse their economy gets. The more things will collapse on them. 
So we do have a good deal to be hopeful for, especially if we can get back to sound money. So to get a copy of The Great Withdrawal, all you need to do is call a toll-free number, which is 800 630 1494. That's 1-800-630-1494. Or as I like to say, it's a lot like Columbus, but it isn't quite 1492. It's 800-630-1494. Just leave your name, your phone number. We'll get back to you. We'll find out what kind of book you'd like. Would you rather have an electronic version or a paper version? Uh, And this way, we'll be able to contact you as other books. This is the fourth book in a series of 12. We'll be able to let you know when the other books are coming out. Okay. All right. Great withdrawal. And that number, 800-630-1494. Lowell, in the remaining minutes, uh, I want to ask you, I understand you also wrote a book about cooling. Yeah, I wrote a book about world climate which ironically was praised by many global warming people, like the late Dr. Stephen Schneider back when he was deputy head of the Climate Project at the National Center for Atmospheric Research. Okay, how did you get, uh, if if the book is about cooling, how did you get the praise from a global warming uh, guy? Because Steve's attitude was the important thing is that whether we warm or cool, either way it's going to cause many of the same problems on the planet. It will reduce food supplies and so on. Mm Mm-hmm. And, and what, what do you see coming? He just wanted to make people more aware of global climate change. Mm-hmm. And it was rather unfair because after that he always got blamed for being a cooling theorist when he was always a warming advocate. Mm-hmm. So, so do you see do you see a period of global cooling coming to us? Oh well, we're certainly seeing that right now. The so-called global warming ended 18 years ago. Part of the thing people need to understand: climate and weather are not the same thing. Climate is based on the concept of a 30-year averaging of weather. And since we had global cooling from 1940 till about 1979 or 1980, there has not been a 30-year period of warming since then. So by the strict rules of climatology, the people claiming warming should shut up. Mm -hmm. Until there's a 30-year period of warming, there is no change in climate. The last prevailing 30-year trend has been cooling. And we've been slowly cooling, well, for about the last 18 years. The ice pack in the Arctic is now getting thicker. The ice in Antarctica is getting thicker. Uh, Weather conditions are moving in a cooling trend, not a warming trend on the planet. This is what you would actually expect. Because do you want to do a long technical discussion of this? We can do it. We've got five, to. No, we've got five minutes because the reason is, is that you know, I've, I've interviewed a number of scientists and physicists and solar scientists and climatologists who, who are very convinced that we have entered into a long-term cooling cycle oh, yeah. uh, that's going to see dramatic impact on food production and migration of, of population and so forth. Well, 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 the main thing people need to understand – The sun is not a constant star. The sun slightly changes its output. And it does this in a regular pattern. So about every thousand years, it goes into a period of called solar maximum, where it burns a little bit hotter than usual, and that warms up our climate here on Earth. We entered a solar maximum around the year 1850. Uh, we began to go back into a period away from solar maximum with the sudden cooling of the world in 1940. In fact, Adolf Hitler had been counting on the world being as hot as it had been in the 1930s in the Dust Bowl era uh, to let him invade Russia. And I'm sure he was more shocked than anyone when suddenly they went back to the winter Russia kind of conditions that had destroyed Napoleon and his army. But that's what you would actually expect is... These things last about 100 years. We'd be expecting it to be disappearing right about now. Uh, And therefore, we're just following the normal pattern on the planet. That means we will be cooler than we've known in our lifetime for the next, oh, 900 years or so. We had a solar maximum at the time of the Viking outbreak. We had a solar max when they were growing wine. England was a major wine producer in Europe a 1,000 years ago. Uh, And then... A thousand years before that, the time of Christ, they were having unusual warming on the planet, <clears throat> which more or less wiped out the, up until then, fairly green area we now call the Sahara. They used to have all kinds of lakes in the Sahara. Uh, so strange things keep happening mm-hmm. low, around the planet. Uh, low my, uh, uh, you know, my review of, of history of, of various cooling cycles shows me that... that uh, 
if if we are going into a significant cooling cycle, then th- there is going to be widespread suffering. That there's you're going to see um, high mortality rate among livestock. Uh, you're going to see a mass migration of people out of northern regions. You're going to see drastic curtailment of food production. Uh, do you think that we're that what we're going into is it that? significant or is it just going to be a lot milder than what I'm describing? Apparently ice ages do not come with glaciers inching down from the North Pole. They come with the areas that now get snowfall in winter simply getting snowfall all year round. Yes. As, As I said in my book, The Cooling, what that means is if we had seven winters in a row like the winter of 1971 72, we would be back to an ice age. Mm hmm in terms of snow, because the snow comes down, it blankets the land, it acts like a mirror. It keeps sunlight from, I mean, just in the year 1918, for example, or 1815, pardon me, for example, shortly after our revolution, we had a thing called the year without summer, where the snow came down heavily enough because two major volcanoes were erupting on the planet at the same time and dimming the atmosphere, that the snow simply stayed on the ground in the shade of rocks and trees and so on, down to the Carolinas all 12 months of the year. Now, you have just a few winters like that in a row. Once the snow fully occupies the ground and doesn't melt off, then it just stays and begins piling up until 20,000 years ago, the ice lay more than 3,000 feet deep over what today we call Chicago. That's an ice age. And yet, the temperature on a summer day in parts of Iowa would have been roughly the same as it is today during the during that ice age. I mean, the ice just went so far and stopped. And this is apparently how ice ages actually happen. So it's much closer than you might think. It, it would only take a little tipping of the balance. But the thing is, this is what the left doesn't like to have talked about this. We know how to control the thermostat of the planet already. We would know how to drive back global warming if we wanted We would know how to drive back global cooling if we wanted. We could do it by environmental modification. But they don't want to talk about that because the real agenda behind global warming is massive empowerment of government, massive obliteration of the rights of private property and business. They just want a huge expansion of government power, which is why they will not accept any alternative solution, such as dusting the high upper atmosphere with sulfur. I mean, we could turn down global warming just with that. Are are you a proponent of geoengineering the climate? In the case of the sulfur in the upper atmosphere, sure, because if you do it and it proves to be ineffective or wrong, then all of that filters out of the atmosphere automatically within two years. It's Mm -hmm. not a permanent damaging change. How much much geoengineering is going on right now? That is a large part of what my book, The Cooling, was all about, Mm -hmm. because I was a... uh, I was a Pentagon think tank specialist involved in NMOD, environmental modification, and questions like, could a terrorist trigger an earthquake and things like that. Uh, So, yes, a good deal of that could be going on, and we wouldn't even know it. Besides terrorists terrorists triggering an earthquake, what about governments? Can governments trigger earthquakes? Of course, of course, Mm -hmm. if they really want to. Mm -hmm. But, uh, I mean, we developed a system where you could rip the whole seam of the earth open and set off massive global uh, uh, volcanoes spewing stuff into the atmosphere and thereby kill the whole planet if we wanted to. But, okay. of course, we don't want to. Well, and, until, uh, yeah, until mankind gets to the point that it's destroying itself. Um, well, we may be doing that anyway, but this is the experiment we've dealt with ever since we started using tools and fire and so on. Mm-hmm. So, uh, but, how, do we, how do we know that some of these major earthquakes were not man-made? Uh, well, we really don't. And, and in the case of other things, it's even more intriguing. For example, when we were fighting in, in Vietnam, we acknowledged through the Pentagon Papers that we were doing cloud seeding experiments. Uh, during that war, North Vietnam in one year was hit by more hurricanes than it had suffered in 1,100 years. And it would be very simple to seed hurricanes. I mean, you just go out in a hurricane air path and you begin sowing 
cloud seeding material in circles, so you create a circular energy release in the atmosphere. Every one of those would be like a seed for a future hurricane. What, what if what if a uh, an enemy of the United States uh, strategically set off a undersea earthquake near Fukushima and uh, those crippled uh, reactors collapse? Well, we're, of course, being hypothetical Mm -hmm. here. It presumably is an enemy that does not border anywhere on the Pacific Ocean because you'd be building up radioactivity in the air over the Pacific and in the ocean currents all around the Pacific Basin. Uh, But you'd also be putting more radioactivity into air currents that circulate around the whole planet. So it would be a rather dire thing to do. But heaven knows uh, we and other major countries have studied uh, environmental modification, in part because any time you try to figure out how can we prevent tornadoes, as the Soviets have done for a long time, or how can we prevent uh, or how can we increase rainfall in one particular area, you realize, for example, that what was it? The state of Colorado threatened to sue the state of Washington back in the 1970s because Washington had been doing cloud seeding, and Colorado claimed that that was stealing their rainfall. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is the difficulty. There is no such thing as good weather. What what is good weather to one person is bad Mm -hmm. weather to another. You might want a sunny day for a picnic. The farmer down the road might want rain for his crops. How advanced is the, the science of weather warfare? Uh, We do not know. It could be quite advanced at this point. And it might explain why we're seeing such bizarre weather alteration. But the difficulty is we're not quite smart enough to know or to use predictably these methods because we're subject to the butterfly effect. I mean, a butterfly flapping its wings in Tokyo today will change the weather where you live two weeks later, but in unpredictable ways. We don't have enough sensors. We don't have big enough computers to know that reliably. We do know that they experiment with it. We do know that years ago uh, they were having a drought near Rapid City, South Dakota. They did cloud seeding, and immediately thereafter a rainstorm happened that washed out the whole downtown part of the city, and the government then said our cloud seeding had nothing to do with it. Similar thing happened in Los Angeles, leading one to say, oh, so you were spending money on cloud seeding that you now say didn't work. Lowell, what are the um, the uh, objects in the sky that I've observed, uh, at least since the late 1990s, that are commonly called chemtrails? Well, that is another interesting question. You look at them, and they do often have this weird rainbow shimmer as if they had something like oil in them, don't they? Mm-hmm. And they, they so, spread out, they fan out, and they become artificial clouds. Well, alas, I'm not George Norrie. So. All right. Well, what do you think they are? <clears throat> I have no, uh, no inside knowledge. It was so long ago that I did mm-hmm. this kind of work. But when you look up in the I sky, when thinking. you look up in the sky and you see the sky full of them, don't you think that's weird? Oh, I do. And living where I do in Southern California, I often see that. Mm-hmm. So, yes, if... if If some enemy of whatever kind were deciding to modify our population, and by the way, well, the the enemy, well, the enemy would have to be inside the United States because these these uh, trails are all over the USA. So it's it's not a foreign uh, entity that's coming here doing it. You can watch the aircraft fly by. You can see it yourself. Who's doing it and why? That I do not have a good answer for. Mm Hmm. See, you knew you would find something that you couldn't answer. But, you know, it's one of those topics that uh, you can't get anybody to answer. If I had an answer, I would give it to you. Yeah. In this case, I just happen not to because I don't have enough time in my life to study everything. But I hope people will get the book that I have devoted a great deal of time to showing many of the tricky, sneaky ways that they manipulate our economy. Mm -hmm. You know, you know. You have to understand the progressives who have basically ruled us since 1913, off and on for the last hundred years, uh, these are control freaks. These are nanny statists. These are people who think they can do anything to you for your own good, that Mayor Bloomberg can tell you what you can eat, what you can drink, what you can say, what you can think, and so on. And part of that, they would not hesitate 
to do things that would collectively modify our health, whether it be putting chemicals in the drinking water or giving us inoculations uh, that may actually do more or less than we're told they do. I mean, who, who can say what they might be doing. We do know, for example, that all the regulations they've dumped on us the last 60 years, if those had not happened, if we'd been free of those, then according to a major economic study that came out last January and that we document and and give you links to in the book, shows that instead of the average American family earning $53,000, down about uh, almost $3,000 under the Obama administration, Uh, the average American family would today be earning $330,000 a year. Instead of our economy being $16 trillion GDP, with about 39% of that federal, state, and local spending, so even that isn't real productivity, uh, our our GDP nationally would be about $54 trillion a year. Well, the bleeding of the American people has been going on for a long time. The last hundred years, we calculate they've basically robbed the American people of $220 trillion. And where did the money go? I mean, if you steal money, you've got to take it somewhere. Policy and do-goodism. And I, think it would, I think it goes deeper than that. I think, it, I think, I think there is a ruling class that has taken uh, the wealth of, of, of America, and they're robbing. You know, they're, They've got one more big robbery that they're ready to pull off, and uh, they're headed towards what they think is going to be the grand finale of their long-term, long-range scheme of global well, government. We, we know that President Obama, in his famous first speech in Berlin, not the failed second one, but the first one, declared himself to be a citizen of the world. And the last time I looked at my Constitution, I don't see where citizen of the world qualifies yeah. one. Well, he, he, Obama just picked up where George Bush left off and where Bill oh, Clinton sure. left off and where Papa Bush left off. It's just that, it's, That's why I'm a libertarian and not a Republican or a Democrat. All right. Well, we're going to let that be the final word. My guest today, Lowell Ponte, and uh, he's uh, making an offer to our True News audience. If you want a copy of his book for free, Great Withdrawal, uh, you can call 800 630 Nine four. Thank you, Lowell. Enjoyed the conversation. Rick, it's an honor. Thank you for being a courageous beacon of truth. The book of the Revelation of Jesus Christ tells us about many catastrophic disasters that will happen in the last days, and I don't think all of them will be done by God. I think a lot of the destruction will be man-made. Jesus said that if God doesn't shorten the days, no flesh would survive, and no flesh means humans and animals. God steps in when man has ripped this planet to pieces, and the destruction is so widespread, he can't allow it to go on anymore. On this subject of weather modification, Satan's followers must resort to technology. That's because Satan has no creative powers. He can only imitate the one true God. Our Heavenly Father, however, doesn't need technology. He speaks and things happen. In Genesis, he flooded the world. In Exodus, he sent hail and fire on Egypt. In Joshua, he used hail on the Amorites. In 1 Samuel, he used thunder to make the Philistines run. In Nahum, he sent judgment upon the wicked through a whirlwind. In Leviticus, he closed the sky and parched the earth. In Deuteronomy, he rewarded the obedient with abundant rain. In Hosea, he withheld the rain. In Jonah, he used a great storm on the sea to persuade a reluctant prophet to obey. In Matthew, the sky turned dark when Jesus died upon the cross and an earthquake shook Jerusalem. In Revelation, great hailstones pummel the wicked. Yes, the governments of the world have fearsome technologies to control the weather, but their power is nothing compared to our God and King. This world will burn away when Christ appears. I'm looking forward to the new Jerusalem. And there won't be any Illuminati freaks there. No madmen, no wars, no suffering. Christ will wipe away the tears.